uh, welcome to this talk. I just want to say something at the very beginning. And uh, uh, so we have left some time at the end uh, for questions. So if you have any questions, uh, go to Slack channel uh, conference room. No, something number something seven. number seven. Yeah. And ask your questions there, uh, and uh, we will read the questions at the end and try to answer some of them uh, at the end of the talk. Okay, thank you. Hello. This besides me is uh, Tom Erik, and I am Tim Bredsen. Welcome to our world. With our agricultural background, we understand how the earth functions and what required for producing food with it. We both have many years experience as consulting in the tech industry and we are both certified in the cloud platform Amazon Web Services. I have 10 years experience as a beekeeper. We have experience in both agriculture and technology. I start my day by taking care of the animals before heading to Oslo to help business thrive in the field of IT. We see how te the technology that surrounds us in Oslo can be of great value for farms all over the world. Because NDC is a virtual conference this year, we had the opportunity to broadcast live from my farm and the BIOT headquarters. So where are we? We are currently broadcasting from Ashim, a city about 45 minutes southeast of Oslo. The bees you can see in the background is located here. It is named Kurasang, and the translation of the Norwegian word Kurasang would be. The audio codec filters filters out both birds and the humming of the bees. So you just have at Kurisan, we are sheep, and we also have twenty-five beehives. Sorry about that, we've got some message. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> we strive to achieve the highest quality by growing everything organic, part of reaching the requirements of organic farming. A normal pig house in Norway, a pig has one square meter of a concrete to live his life on. A true farm. Each pig has 200 square meters of outdoors far farmland to call his own. Also, a part of the generative movement, focusing on local ecosystems at the farm, respecting the farm and soil's ability to produce, binding it stronger year by year. Today, we are going to focus on the bees and the technology. But first, what are the major challenges that agriculture face today? So, just yes. some slight technical issue. Okay. Uh, Kim, could you just adjust your uh, mic uh, a little? Yeah, to make it better. Yeah, that was that was much better. I'm gonna try this. Uh, interrupt me again if it's not good. Yeah, no, this is better. Okay. The way we see it, we are removing ourselves from the basic principle of nature. As a society, we are trying to increasingly manipulate nature instead of working with it. Sustainability is the keyword, and that means an ecosystem in balance. Agriculture is responsible for 10% of the world's greenhouse. To eat, we need food. 
more food in order to feed the growing population. In the last decade, we have solved the increasing demand of food by using chemicals and increasing the size of the machinery. Dead soil does not store carbon gas. It releases it out into the atmosphere. A thriving and living soil stores carbon gas and becomes a part of the solution to the climate change. In a beehive, there are up to 60,000 bees, only one queen, a couple of hundred men, and the rest are ladies in different life stages. There are cleaning bees, nursing bees, guard bees, engineering bees, bees that fly around and collect nectar, and bees that receive that nectar and takes it inside the hive for storage. It's all a tough job. 150 years ago, we used our hands to remove the weed from the field. Today, we are using harmful chemicals, harmful both for the soil and the humans. Today, our big challenge is glyphosate. You may know it as Roundup, as it's sold in your local garden center. It is an eye-opener that in a large study conducted in Germany, all participants had traces of glyphosate in their body. But what should the farmer do? He is dependent on effective and in economical sound food production. We believe that technology has the answers. With the help of robots and machine learning, we can go back to a way of working that's on nature's premise. Today technology with today's technology. plants and weeds and remove them without human intervention. Uh, the bees that you see behind me here, they can fly up to three kilometers away from the hive. And one bee can produce one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in its lifetime. That's a tough job. The machines the farmers are using gets bigger and bigger. We apply the rules of capitalism we centralize and streamline the production. In Norway, we lose productive soil because the machines that are available is too large to be able to operate. Productive soil is the basis of producing food. The large machines weigh many thousand kilos. The weight of the machines compresses the air out of the soil. The soil becomes hard as a rock. We cannot produce few food on dead soil. The queen can lay up to 2,000 eggs per day. She places it inside an empty cell in the brood chamber, which we'll look at soon, where it hatches into a larvae, which is fed by the nursing bees. Then the cell is sealed, and the larvae changes into a new worker bee. Its first task is to clean out her cell. So it's a tough job all the way from the beginning. Bees hold a special place in my heart. I simply love them. We can contribute to the food we eat through pollination, and we of course can eat the honey. We know that honey is one of the very few government-approved pharmaceuticals for, for relief of coughing, or well, that research results show that honey has a good effect on resistant bacteria. And that's before we start talking about other things the bees produce. Wax, propolis, and queen jelly, to name a few. But bees are dying. As an example, one third of the bees died during the winter of 2008-18 in the USA. It now seems clear that it's not a single case, but many compound cases. Most can be traced back to the challenges we've already talked about. The renowned institute, Earthwatch Institute, named the bees the most important living creature at the planet. At the same time, more and more scientists are placing the bees on the list of endangered species. We want to contribute 
insight to the, both the farmer, the consumer, and the researcher. EIOT allows a broader audience to gain insight into the bee's fascinating world. But perhaps the most important thing is that we want to take the bees away from the list of endangered species. By gathering data and using technology to see relationships in the data, we can gain new knowledge. Data can form the basis of research and knowledge, good decisions for politicians. Being a beekeeper today is a tough job. Beekeepers do live a long time. They do eat a lot of honey. But many have a tired body. It's a lot of heavy lifting. There are many operations, many trips to the, to the apiary, lots of traveling. A, beekeep, a beehive can get four boxes full of honey during the summer that the beekeeper needs to take on and off every time he visits the hive. The bees are also disturbed a lot today. With today's way of working, basically the same as 150 years ago, the recommendations are an inspection of the hive every week. And we're going to show an inspection soon later. To check that the bee colony is doing well, you have to open the hive. This is like a declaration of war for the bees. Who is disturbing our house? OK, so now we're going to uh, take a closer look at the beehive. Uh, so, uh, Kim is now going to uh, bring the camera over and we're just going to walk through um, the basics of the traditional beehive uh, and if maybe our sound guy Martin can just uh, let us know that we're, we have everything in the picture because we can't see the preview. <laughs> Yeah, everything looks fine so far, and I can okay. still hear you well, so... So this is our first uh, prototype, and it's built into a traditional beehive. Uh, so the... Except for the techie uh, add-ons. Uh, there's a bottom, bo uh, uh, bottom board at the bottom, uh, which is basically uh, functions as uh, ventilation from underneath the hive. And there's also an entrance in front of the bottom board where the bees can enter and leave the beehive. Uh, and on top of the bottom board, there's the brood chamber. This is where the queen lives. Um, she only stays inside the brood chamber where she lays her eggs and uh, where the, um, the new bees are brought up. Uh, and there's a separator between the brood chamber and the rest, which prevents the queen from traveling upwards into the rest of the hive. And then on top, uh, the beekeeper will put uh, something called super, supers, uh, which is basically uh, where the honey is stored, uh, the food storage. Uh, so that's the, the structure of the traditional beehive, which has been like this for 50 years. Uh, which is uh, basically the way it looks in commercial beekeeping all over the world. And of course, there's a roof on top um, to protect from weather and stuff like that. So now we will switch and uh, Kim will take you on a little journey to show you how an actual inspection works. I'm going to have to adjust the camera a little bit. And... Is that a nice view of the hive for you guys? I still see you uh, fine. Yeah. yeah. So when the beekeeper starts an inspection, he basically starts by looking at the way the bees flies. So that's also why we have a camera in this IT solutions. And what I can see here is that the bees are busy. They're obviously collecting honey because there's a lot of traffic in and out and there's no uh, there's a normal activity uh, at the opening of the hive. So then I basically need to go all the way into the hive to check that it's normal, all the way into the, uh, the bottom box where the queen lives. And 
I have some tools. This one is uh, the most important tool. It's made for breaking up and loosening all the parts of the beehive. So that's just an insulator that you took off right now? Yeah, that insulates. Because inside here it's about 37 degrees and that's all that been the, all the heat has been made from uh, from the bees obviously this is also a board that's made so the bees have can walk up in the cube and over the frames you can see here and that, they're also very calm today at least still they're calm and that's because they have a job to do the many bees here are out collecting honey seen in our solution it's been already a couple of kilos honey being made by the bees today so uh, we installed this uh, prototype uh, just uh, around two weeks ago uh, and we already have a couple of kilos of honey so now we've opened up the first super um, and we're going to look at one of the frames yeah Where the honey is stored. Yep. So let's see if we see any what the status of this box is. So already the bees are starting to get a little bit agitated. You maybe you can't see it or hear it. Uh, but there's uh, all the bees that are sitting on here, they're busy doing other stuff, but there are other bees around us that are kind of wondering what's going on. Yeah. So here you can see if they've started to collect honey. That's the uh, see-through liquid here. Honey in here. And also in these cells, it's pollen. So they collect both pollen and, and nectar from the bees. Here you can see they're exchanging food. This pollen is a very important nutrient for, um, so it's basically protein, uh, important nutrient for the new brood. Can also see how old they are. The more fur they have, it tears off when they're out flying and working. So here everything looks normal. I also have here a new frame that's not started to build upon yet. So you can see here that they've just started to build a new frame, and that's a good sign. It means that they have uh, they have hope for the future. With them building. They feel they need more space to store more honey. So at this point, you don't think it's necessary to install another super? No, it's a lot of, when you looked at the cells, there was still a lot of room left for more honey. Yeah. So it's no need. So there can be more, several reasons for adding a new super. It could be that they're full of honey and Either it's full of bees. So there's quite a lot of bees here. Yeah. So we might need to install another super in a, a week or so yeah. in order to not make it uh, enough room for all the bees. Yeah. So that is kind of an illustration that it's important to, to uh, be on guard and, and inspect quite often uh, so that the bees have everything they need. Now I just remove the entire case because I need to get into the bottom box to see the... Mm -hmm. And it's quite heavy. I think this is maybe half full of honey already. Half based full on the of weight. honey in two weeks. Yep. Okay. At, yeah. And now, the, of course, nature is are exploding. So it's, it's nectar everywhere for the bees to collect. So this is the queen excluder. The queen is a bigger bee, so it can't get past this, uh, this, uh, this, this hair. So already now we start to see problems by opening the hive. We see a bit of competition because the bees from the other hive get in and try to steal the honey. And that becomes a competition and it, it becomes a war basically. So we see a beginning of a war between the hives here. <laughs> And now, See, now they're getting angry because yeah. we're basically going into their home and destroying it. Yeah. Okay, so now we're uh, looking into the brood chamber. This is the heart of the hive. And this is somewhere down there is the queen. Um, 
you think we'll see her today? Well, there's 10 frames here, yeah. so we just have to see here. At an inspection, the best thing is to see the queen, because then you know that everything is okay. But you can also look for signs that the queen is here, like a freshly laid egg. It, uh, so we'll see, we'll try. Operating at a slower speed that I usually than I usually would do. Yeah. Okay. I'll just look for the queen first. No, no queen here. No queen. There's a lot of sealed cells. Yeah. So the sealed cells here. That's uh, bees. That's the final stage of creating a bee. So the bee is in that stage about five days. And you can see besides there are cells with larvas in it and different sizes of larvas as well. I don't know how well you guys can see this, but uh, we'll yeah. do our best. <laughs> this is an experiment, so hopefully you'll see something at least. Uh, yeah. There's also eggs. Can you see some eggs? Yeah, the eggs are really difficult yeah. to see. Um, I don't think you guys will be able to see them because they're super, There's super eggs small. here. If you can try to focus in, you can see if you can see the eggs. They're kind of super, super thin strains. Short, thin strains, white. Yep. Um, and there's also honey on the sides of this frame and pollen. So this is a very good frame for, for uh, bee production because they have both food and production of new bees here. Then, in order to check the status, and this is full of honey, this is actually a honey frame. So what you okay. see here is honey. It's about maybe three kilos of honey in this. So that's a problem, basically, because then they can't use this to lay egg. It's full. Okay. So we, we want the honey at the top, not the below the queen excluder. there. These uh, sealed cells are worker bees. That's female worker mm -hmm. bees. That's what you can see all around here, basically. And here, it's cells of males. They're a bit bigger, so it pops out a bit. And down here, you can see the start of a queen cell. Uh, that's what we call a cup, so it's a start. The queen cell will go all the way down to the bottom of the frame. So that's a big... Uh, a big animal. So just to see if just, I uh, interrupt here for a second here. If you could um, <laughs> stop sharing of uh, the main screen, uh, I think uh, perhaps more of the bandwidth would go to the web camera. Okay, I can try that. Um... I can still hear you clearly, but uh, the video is choppy and uh, okay. now it's also low resolution. It was like three frames per second high resolution earlier. Okay, uh, let me see if I can do this. I got some angry bees following me over here now. <laughs> I need to take off my gloves. So I need to go to the WebEx application. Sharing. Okay, we'll try that and then we'll reshare the screen when we're done with the inspection. Yeah, the web camera Here? also turn off. Camera also turn off. Yeah. Mm. Should be uh, by the mute button, uh, a red camera, start my video. Not there better. Go. Okay, and it's the correct camera, so okay, awesome. So we didn't pull any plugs or anything? No. Nope. Why is running all over the API? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the first time we ever do this live demo, 
will be fun. Okay, uh, so we try again? Yeah. Just shout if there's anything. Yeah, I will. Okay, we're back. Okay. While you were fixing the technical issue, I'm just going through frames, and there you can see the queen, actually. Okay. Can you guys see the queen? There's Hopefully. A blue dot on the back there. Yeah. So the queen, now, just now, is walking on cells full of honey, trying to find an empty cell to lay her egg. And of course, she's not going to find this. So this is actually... You can say that it's not enough, rough, not enough room for the queen to lay her eggs in this, uh, in this box. So we should expand. Uh, we should actually move some of the honey frames up to the top box in order to give the queen more space. But there's the queen anyway, so you can see her. Yep. So now we know that it, the state is, is okay. I did find something that was a bit disturbing okay. on this frame here while you were gone. This one. So that is a queen cell. Yep. And you can actually, it's very interesting because you can see here. It's a sealed cell, because if it weren't sealed, it would be a hole in the bottom, like it's a hole here. But the queen has actually been here and killed this, uh, the, uh, the new queen inside the, the queen cell. Okay. So that's, they're biting there, for she doesn't want to be, because uh, it's only one queen in uh, one hive, so she doesn't want to give up her place. Okay, so there's beginning of a war because uh, the queen cells are basically the community as a whole they decide to make it yeah because they're unhappy with the current queen for some reason yep uh, so some of the bees are unhappy in here yep and if i would guess it's because of the lack of space of making eggs so yeah. they they're so strong that they want to move out Uh, we've seen some problems, yep. and uh, the next step here would be to do something about those problems. Yeah. Uh, and as you can see, it's quite time consuming. Yep. So I'm just going to remove the whole breed box as well, just to look, have a brief look at the technology. Okay, so now there's a full-on war here. Um, this is the bottom board that we were talking about earlier. Uh, and uh, the bottom board is basically our hub for our technology um, and we're just going to run through very quickly the hardware that we have here uh, of course you have on the side here you can see it maybe Kim you can point with your fingers yeah. on the side here there's the uh, box uh, inside of that box we have a Raspberry Pi and we have the battery package a charger and stuff like that. Um, and connected to the battery uh, to the uh, to the Raspberry Pi uh, there's, uh, of course, the antenna, which uh, is connected to um, LTM uh, mobile broadband, optimized for IoT. And uh, there's some sensors that you can see there. There's the temperature and humidity sensor uh, combined together in, in a single chip. And, of course, uh, both temperature and humidity are environmental uh, factors that uh, affect the bees and their behavior. Um, so since this temperature <laughs> sensor is actually not inside the brood chamber, um, it's more indicative of kind of the surrounding environment. We also would like to put a temperature uh, sensor inside the brood chamber. So actually inside where um, the queen is because uh, that's a, uh, very important to monitor the temperature there uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, anomalies in the temperatures there can indicate problems. Um, and there's also a microphone there, um, which is actually a pretty good microphone to be that small, which is called MEMS, the technology. It means uh, very small, but very good. Uh, and um, 
The enclosure, as you can see, the bees have actually managed to tear it off. So now they're crawling all over the sensors, which give us very, very weird data. But it's interesting for us in the prototyping phase to see how the bees will actually uh, cope with us putting a lot of weird stuff inside their home, basically. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the data that these sensors collect in a bit, but we also have a camera on the side there. I don't know if you can see it. It's a very standard Raspberry Pi camera module uh, uh, with the, the infrared filter removed, so we can also see at night. Um, and the camera basically has a shot um, kind of on an angle in front of the entrance, so we can see uh, bees uh, leaving, entering the hive, uh, so that we can analyze basically um, a number of things that we can see from there uh, is are like number one, are the bees actually out flying? And uh, how are they flying can tell us something about what kind of bees they are and, and uh, what they're up to at any point in time. Um, uh, and also, uh, you can see, maybe we can see it. I'm going to try and show it to you. Uh, underneath the bottom board, we have a custom frame that we have installed, which is uh, basically the weight sensor. Uh, it's uh, pretty much functions the same way as a bathroom scale. Like you have in your bathroom, it's the same principle. There's a strain gauge in each corner, uh, which is connected with an um, open scale uh, board in the middle, uh, which basically combines the, the signals and interprets them for us and, and sends us basically digital readings over serial uh, back to the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I think of everything that we've done so far with the hardware, the weight sensor has given us the most problems so far. Uh, we had to try a number of different solutions before we landed on the open scale uh, module. Uh, Arduino chip on it, which does a lot of processing that we otherwise would have to do ourselves. Um, so with that, we can actually tear the scale and calibrate it remotely, uh, which is very beneficial for the for the beekeeper, when he installs new equipment, he can uh, zero the scale, basically, uh, from an app. Uh, okay, we don't see the solar panel here today because we haven't installed it yet. So we're actually charging this from uh, a power cable right now. Uh, but we're going to install the solar panel to, uh, with the uh, something called the Pi Juice project, if anyone's heard of that. Uh, Okay, so that's the run through of the current hardware. I'd just like to show you this is a newly hatched bee, maybe just an hour old or something. Okay. You can see all the fur. Uh, if you compare it like to a normal bee that's been out uh, a day before, that's a total different uh, look of the bee. Yep. What, what is he doing up there? He's confused. Because <laughs> everything me. is upside down, he doesn't know. Yeah, we open up everything and all the bees are, what's going on? alone please and of course that's what we want to do something about yeah so this inspection needs to be done every uh, every week yeah. yeah and that's just one hive that's one hive yeah and if you're a professional beekeeper um, you have to you may, maybe you have a couple of hundreds yeah. Hives. In Norway, I think the definition of a full-time beekeeper is you have 250 hives. Yeah. So you have to do this uh, 250 times every week. So imagine that. Um, okay, we're going to go back. Uh, try to put the camera in the same place. Oh, that was completely wrong. <laughs> I think oh, yeah. Unless it's not. <laughs> Sorry about this. We'll be back soon. Okay, 
Hey, you guys still with us? Yep. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to try and share our presentation again. We're also on 4G network here, so that might be explaining why things are a bit slow. Okay, we have 20 minutes. Okay, there's not too many bees around. No, it's not too bad. Okay, I get the clicker. Okay, you guys can see uh, the presentation now. Okay. So, uh, when we opened up the beehive, we were looking to answer uh, some key questions. Um, just to recap, like the strength of the hive, how many bees are there, the status of the queen, is she there, are the bees trying to make a new queen, in this case it looked like uh, the bees were indeed trying to make a new queen, uh, and the brood status, is the queen producing brood, can we observe eggs, larvae, sealed cells, stuff like that, uh, disease, I don't think we looked for disease today, uh, or no. you, maybe you did. Yeah, but you can smell. If there's a disease, you yeah. can often smell it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, do the bees have enough food? Are they collecting honey? Do they have enough space? Do we need to expand their room to store more food? Otherwise, if they don't have enough room, they will just flee. Flee the scene and find somewhere else to be. Which is a problem, of course. Um, and uh, all of these things happen throughout the year. You have to do this every week throughout the season. You have to do a lot of manual labor, labor uh, install new uh, supers where they store the honey. Uh, and at the end of the season, there's a lot of work as well, which we didn't show here, but uh, you basically have to make sure that uh, all the boxes where the honey is, you have to empty those uh, uh, for bees, that you can't bring the bees back to where you collect the honey. So there's a lot of different ways of doing that, and some of them are not very kind to the bees. Um, and of course, there's also the feeding before the winter. Yeah, we're having a problem uh, here. I'm. Uh, yeah, uh, we're having a problem here. I'm trying to switch back to your uh, slides, but uh, we can only see your. Uh, web camera okay um maybe i didn't i think i forgot to share my screen it's a very simple explanation <laughs> okay here we go and then this one yeah i'm back here we go super okay, is that better yeah. Now you get to see the animation again. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the point being is that there's a lot of uh, work that has to be done throughout the year. And uh, if you have a lot of hives, you can imagine you're not on vacation. Um, uh, so the first step of BIOT is being able to answer all of those questions that we were asking now without actually opening the beehive. That's our kind of, uh, the way that this project started is like, can we do this automated uh, uh, with sensors? Um, although it's a lot of fun for us to go into the beehive, it's not so much fun for them as maybe you uh, saw. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, more about those. Um, I mentioned briefly, but so we have temperature and humidity uh, this one also has pressure, which we haven't uh, collected any data of yet, but basically environmental factors that do affect the bees. Um, uh, and uh, of course, temperature is um, important because bees don't like to be outside in the cold, which means it's too cold, they won't go get food. And under a certain temperature, bees will actually start going into winter hi hibernation. Uh, which could happen at the wrong time. Uh, so it's good for the beekeeper to know about things like this uh, so they can take corrective measures. Um, and inside, uh, I also mentioned this in the inspection, inside 
the brood chamber, there's an optimal temperature. Uh, and anomalies from that can indicate uh, problems that the beekeeper might want to do something about. And the humidity, uh, there's a, um, um, so honey is uh, hygroscopic, which means that it can uh, absorb humidity from the, the air, basically. And if uh, the water content of honey goes above 20%, I think it can start uh, fermenting, which is not good. You don't want to sell fermented honey uh, unless you're making me uh, mead, I guess. Uh, but that's a different process. Um, and uh, there's also uh, uh, something that has to do with uh, the in environment, the conditions inside the hive. Uh, the bees don't like it when it gets too humid, so they will try and ventilate. And if they are not able, then maybe they'll go somewhere else. Um, uh, I mentioned the weight sensor, uh, which are basically a bunch of strain gauges that are connected to this chip, uh, which we landed on. It's a bit of ex expensive, but uh, fortunately, they're, it's composed of all o open source components, so we could mass produce them ourselves. Um, but it's basically you connect to it over serial and it's super easy to use. Uh, we try to find hardware like this that it, we don't want to spend too much time hacking on hardware. And we want to spend our time solving actual problems in like business problems. Uh, so we try to find solutions that make this easy. Um, microphone I mentioned as well. Uh, I would have uh, played some audio from the actual microphone, but I didn't have time to prepare it. Uh, but it's super high quality sound. We can actually hear like people standing beside the beehive talking and it's like almost like the same quality as the microphone I'm using right now. So it's a, uh, I don't know how they do it, but good. Um, yeah, and uh, of course the bees make sound. So that's why we want to record with the rings to communicate. Uh, maybe you didn't hear it. Uh, flying around, they make a lot of angry sounds with the wings. Uh, and uh, it's uh, both kind of communicating to the other bees, like, like, hey, come on, get over here and help me. Or maybe it could be a sign of aggression and telling people to buzz off. And um, so, uh, but there's also a, a lot of things that we don't know about uh, the sounds that they make, and maybe we can learn something from that. Um, the queen also makes some sounds that we're going to listen to in a bit. Um, then there's the camera, uh, which is like standard Raspberry Pi camera module. Uh, uh, the uh, infrared filter removed so you can also see at night or in the dark. Um, and um, I mean, it's a very high quality camera. I, I, eight, I think it's eight megapixels. Uh, can do like uh, 4K video, something like that. Super high quality. Um, and uh, why do we want the camera? Well, I already mentioned some of that. I mean, the, uh, the activity in front of the entrance is interesting because it indicates whether bees are active actively collecting food. Um, uh, we can see something about uh, when the flying activity starts in the morning, when they stop in the evening to see uh, how long kind of their shifts are. And maybe we can learn something about um, uh, production um, patterns uh, uh, with regards to like how, how long the shifts are. Also, there's uh, something that Tim taught me just the other day, actually, is that the new brood, uh, when they exit the hive for the first time, they have a special flying pattern um, to basically set the compass. So, like, you know, to uh, see what direction is the sun. And they do that with a special kind of dance. And uh, um, we thought maybe we can detect that dance. Um, machine learning uh, and uh, use that as a, as a measurement for uh, brood production, how many new bees are produced. Uh, we haven't started this work, so this is all in our minds uh, still. 
Um, uh, so I'm also going to talk a little bit about sensors that we want to install in the next version that we haven't installed yet in this one. Uh, there's basically um, CO2. Um, it's interesting because um, these can actually die from oxy oxygen uh, shortage, uh, which could be caused by uh, lack of ventilation. And CO2 is uh, a very good way of measuring uh, sh uh, oxygen shortage because it uh, it, um, it pushes the ox oxygen away. Um, so um, then there's uh, something called VOC. You can't see it on the ship, but it's called VOC. It's volatile organic compounds, which is a, a sensor that you usually would use to detect like um, toxic fumes. Uh, and stuff like that, basically stuff that smells. Uh, and we thought it would be an interesting experiment to see if the same sensor basically can detect smells that bees produce from uh, glands uh, to communicate with each other or even detect smells that stem from disease. Uh, but all that is super experimental still. Uh, but uh, maybe in next year's NDC talk we'll actually have a demo of that as well. Um, RFID uh, on the Queen. Um, it's, uh, it sounds crazy, but it's actually been done. I mean, uh, there's been research projects that have put RFID chips on not only the Queen, but a large number of bees in, uh, in a beehive and make them pass through a special kind of door both in and out of the hive to register their movement. Uh, we don't, we don't, we're not gonna go all that crazy, but uh, putting it on a bee is uh, manageable because you already, what you do with the queen is that you put a little uh, colored dot on the back to make it easier to recognize her, uh, to see that she's there, but also um, which color you use uh, says, uh, same process you could just put an RFID chip there. Um, why would we want to do this? Well uh, we can see if the queen is there, where she is, um, and if she's gone then that's really important to know. Um, okay. So looking at the time, uh, it's almost time for questions. Uh, so a competent beekeeper could probably answer at least some those questions using all the just the raw data that we collect uh, but it would be very time consuming reading all those charts and looking all through uh, through those numbers and it would be impossible to scale beyond just a handful of hives so that's the, we think that's the problem of the current uh, state of IOT in beehives the solutions that are out there today in the world um, but we can do so much more than that I mean why don't we just make it intelligent and an intelligent beehive turns the workload upside down and uh, why don't we let the beehive tell us when a beekeeper is needed um, and um, so we don't really need to interpret all this sensor data manually uh, but uh, we can be told when there's something that needs to be done uh, and the next step after that again the beehive act uh, on its own upon the data that uh, it interprets. So, uh, for example, uh, we can have the beehive opening and closing the entrance by itself. Um, and um, we can have the beehive regulate access between the brood chamber and the supers. Um, so what we saw is one of the more common tasks of beekeepers is to do this manually. So when the bees need more space, we add more space to it manually. Why don't we just let the beehive do that itself with motors and doors and stuff like that. Um, so uh, ventilation, uh, we talked a lot about uh, ventilation problems. We don't know the extent of uh, 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 why um, beehive 
have a problem with that, uh, but we, that we can learn more about that. But we can have automated ventilation systems that if, the, if it's too hot, lowers the temperature. If it's too humid, uh, fan out the humid air and stuff like that. Um, and also feeding. Uh, we could have uh, uh, food tanks that we could uh, automate access to. Um, so the intelligent beehive is the foundation of a completely different ways of, of keeping bees. The hive can be prepped at the start of the year and left unattended until it's time to harvest the honey. How can we achieve that vision? Well, machine learning can be used to find bees in an image or a video. We don't really need any machine learning expertise to do this. There are already excellent models out there that are capable of recognizing honeybees. This one is uh, run through uh, AWS recognition, which is basically just an API where you send your image and it comes back with, here are your bees. Um, uh, but we can even deploy these models and run the inferences locally on the Raspberry Pi with AWS Greengrass uh, makes that possible for us. Uh, we don't even have to ship the images or the video to the cloud. Um, for more specialized tasks, we probably need to train our own models. Um, so, for example, to see the orientation dance of new bees. Um, machine learning can also be used to categorize sound, and there's uh, some prior work on this, uh, on acoustic analysis with machine learning to predict swarming. Uh, but there's nothing like that in commercial solutions, as far as we know. Um, and uh, queen bees can make a quick characteristic tooting sound, which is believed to be a sign of aggression towards other queens. So in the case of swarming, uh, so just listen to this, if you can get to the right slide. The sound that you heard right now wasn't caught by our microphone, but uh, in theory we could do that. Um, another application for machine learning, um, which to us is kind of the most interesting, is especially at a very large scale when, it's, when we don't necessarily know what we're looking for. We don't know what we could potentially learn, but what is the combination of all the data that we collect? What insights could it lead to about the beehive? Uh, and those are possibly insights the machines will be able to find. Uh, and how can we use that to make beekeeping more effective and more natural? What can we learn about bees and, uh, and why they die? That's what we mean by intelligent beehive. Um, okay, uh, we're running out of time, I think, but um, two uh, last things I want to say is, um, I mean, it's amazing how cloud services and machine learning and commoditized hardware and all those things make it possible to get to an advanced state like this with very little resources. I mean, we haven't spent uh, much money at this at all uh, so far. And um, with a more efficient operation, maybe we can put beehives where it's not possible to put beehives before because of all the manual labor that used to be necessary for it. And more bees, of course, means more pollination, which means more food, hopefully. And uh, we're getting green roofs in Oslo and in cities around the world. Uh, but today it's very expensive to pay someone to look after a hive. Uh, but the intelligent hive is changing that. Um, you can have a hive that looks after itself. And um, man has, uh, has a great inherent interest in understanding nature. And today's society makes this difficult. And uh, we're drawn to the cities and office jobs and food production is drawn into the confined and closed spaces. Uh, but one trend that comes from Europe is to have beehives on private terraces and roofs. Uh, and BIOT also opens up the opportunity for everyone to look into their hives uh, and uh, get closer to nature. Um, but our hive is only on version one. In version two, we need to look at how the cube is physically built up. 
take full advantage of the technology. Maybe um, in the future, the beehive won't look like this anymore. It won't have that kind of structure, but we don't know that yet. We need to learn a lot first, but maybe if we can remove all the kind of repetitive man manual labor, we can refocus the energy of uh, making those changes happen. So we're looking forward to adding more automated operations uh, and so we can focus on learning instead of kind of doing the same things all over again. Um, Here you can see, for example, um, uh, the bees uh, don't have enough space, so the beehive will automatically open up to the next super, and then everyone's happy again. So uh, we see the field of agriculture moving in that direction, uh, which is more harmony in harmony with nature. And uh, we hope you understand a little bit more about bees, and uh, we hope you understand that it's possible for you to make a meaningful contribution to agriculture, or uh, I mean food production, uh, really, with your competence in technology. Um, we can all contribute, and this is our contribution. Um, yeah. So, if you have a commitment to this, we want to get to know you contact us and we've also been on the stage on talking to some politicians and what we said to them that was that agritech can become an export from Norway but we need startup help the state in Norway contributed two million Norwegian kroners for offshore wind turbines billion billion yeah that's yeah. true <laughs> What about one billion to agriculture technology? Thank you for listening. I looked through the chat. It wasn't uh, that many. It was some comments that we can take on uh, working forwards, but I think we can. I can have a last check if there's something, some more questions that pop. Or Martin, if you picked up anything. I'm sorry. What was that? We were just wondering if there were any questions before we... Yeah, there's one uh, question here. Is there a big risk of the queen escaping when you do an inspection? I would say that the biggest risk when doing an inspection is actually killing the queen by squeezing her in some way or another. If the queen escapes, it can actually find her way home, usually. Because, uh, She's been out when she mated with other uh, male bees. There's another question. How long has your pie run from the pie juice? Well, we have a pie juice and we have a big solar panel. That's not actually on today, but there's a panel the size of the roof. So uh, the battery pack itself has just enough power to um, power the this setup in about one day. So we basically need sun. Otherwise, we need to stop communicating and shut down the system temporarily during night. There's still some experimentation left for this, but um, our calculations so far indicate that we could be okay for like 24-hour operation. But uh, uh, we haven't installed it yet, so we. We're not sure. Yeah. Uh, so that's definitely uh, what we're going to focus on in the next uh, few months. Yeah. So there's a question about the product. Yes, this is a product that we're starting to sell after this summer, actually. So this is a startup for us. Um, so I think we're out of time. Have a great weekend. I hope you enjoyed our experiment by sending live from the farm and that the technology was OK, at least. <laughs> And maybe we'll talk to some of you have more discussions later. Yep. Okay, so thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>